Huh? So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Ron Keane. I'm the chair of the Clark Region of Engineers Ireland. And on behalf of the Clark Region, along with our colleagues in Unreach, which is the Kerry Region, and uh, the committee for CPD in Clark County Council, uh, I'd like to welcome you to today's lecture, which is on the design and construction of the Bowhill River Bridge as part of the N22 Valley Verona to Maroon Road Development. Uh, before we start, I'd like to draw your attention to the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, you can ask questions throughout the lecture and we'll take them at the end in the Q&A session. Uh, so now I'd like to hand you over to Jonathan Noonan, who's the Cochrane Council Public Liaison Officer for the project. And uh, Jonathan will introduce our speakers. Thanks, Ronan. I suppose before I introduce the uh, speakers today, i uh, just like to state on behalf of Cork County Council, uh, we're delighted to have achieved uh, such a milestone, the longest structure on the job. And I just want to acknowledge that, that this is a significant achievement on any construction project, but I suppose especially with the challenges that we had on site and also the challenge of COVID and Brexit. And I'd just like to acknowledge the cooperation between Cork County Council, uh, John's John Craddock JV, and the TII Structures Department uh, in particular. Um, so I suppose we, we'll move on to the next slide and um, I'll just go through the speakers. We have uh, John Killen, who's Projects Director for John's John Craddock Joint Venture. We have Martin Bozak, who's Structures Lead with Barry Transportation. And then we'll be moving on to Brian Kernan, who's a Construction Section Manager um, for John's John Craddock. I suppose just to go through the agenda for today. Um, John Killen will give us an overview of the project as well as a background to the, to the Bohol Bridge itself. And then we're just going to show you a very brief animation. It's uh, just for illustration purposes only, um, which will give you an outline of the, of, of the overall structure. And then Martin from Barry Transportation will go through the detailed design of the, the structure. And then we'll hand over to Brian, who will deal with the uh, construction stage, uh, the logistics of getting the beams to site and how, how it was put in place. Um, and at the end of, of that, we'll have a questions and answer session, and uh, we're hoping that the questions will be as uh, hard as possible. Um, so I'll hand over to John Killen, uh, who will talk about the overview of the project. Okay, <clears throat> good afternoon. Uh, it's supposed to give you a summary of the overview of the key parameters in the project. Uh, the Ballyvory McCroom Bypass is a 22 kilometre long <clears throat> mainline 2.2 plus 2 carriageway between four main junctions. And there's four major river crossings, and there's 40 local road and junction and access crossings. So there's a high number of uh, bridges along the length of the 22 kilometres. I think it averages out nearly a structure every 200 metres if you average them out, they're high density. Uh, one of the big challenges of the project is that it's a very sensitive ecological habitat, um, which along, along sort of, uh, we've got fresh water power muscle, carry slug, along with the other uh, um, protected species along the road. Uh, so as long as the, the job is a challenge in topography, uh, that it's sort of somebody described it when they came to visit as moonscape. Sort of on the eastern side, you've got the, the sort of flat of pasture lands, but halfway along the line as you go west, put the West Cork sort of uh, rocky terrain. Uh, the ground conditions is predominantly uh, silt uh, with gravels overlay and overlay and rock, uh, which leads to very uh, high flood risks. Uh, but half the job is flowing, running along the Slan uh, River Valley. So there's a, a very flash flood scenario event happens. Uh, you can see uh, the structures on the job. There's 44 bridges, including four large river bridges. Uh, the one got, the guys we've been talking about today is the Bowman Bridge. It's the largest, 120 metre span, 122 metre span. Uh, we have three other large river bridges, uh, the Forish, which is a, I think it's a 39 metre span, single span. We've got the longest, uh, pre-stressed concrete beams ever used in UK and Ireland on the, on the Laney River Bridge. They're 49.9 metres long. And we have a two-span 100 metre bridge on the Salam River Bridge as well. Uh, and on top of that, then, we've got 59 large culverts. Uh, some of the culverts are large structures in themselves. Uh, you know, they're 60 metres long. Some of them are five and a half metres wide and four metres high. Uh, some of them are designed as in situ portals. So they're major structures in their own right. And we've got seven retaining wall structures. Uh, some of them, the site is quite confined, uh, and then with the with the difficult uh, topography, there's a need for some reinforced retaining walls for uh, holding side roads, and then there's a, a lot of uh, ESB high voltage pylons that have to be retained uh, to, 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 to the robots have to be retained around those as well. 
So again, there's 110 structures on the project. Uh, the earthworks, there's a total earthworks volume of 2.7 million cube. Um, and there's a bit of double handling required uh, due to the nature of the mounted bridges preventing access. So that probably goes over 3 million quite quickly. And the rock volume is probably the biggest sort of feature on the job is, is 1.25 million cube of rock. Um, the program uh, was 39 month program, uh, November 2019 to February 2023. Um, we were barely started the job when obviously the COVID uh, scenario hit and uh, it's been challenging. Uh, so like we said, a good start is, is a great thing, but we didn't really get that because we were closed from February through to May um, and then we came back in May and got going again. Uh, I think the, the, the project team, as Jonathan said earlier, are working well together, Cork County Council, Barry Transportation, Mott Middall, to sort of make back the sort of the, the bad start and we're gaining ground every month as we go. So the critical path in the job uh, was obviously detailed design. Uh, so to get the site, get this SI done, get the detailed design completed, construct the bridges uh, for their operations and onto the roadworks. I suppose this is best exemplified at the Bogle Bridge in Cut One. Uh, this is sort of a, a, an elevation and plan view of, of, the, of the entire 22 kilometer section. So you can see where my cursor is here and uh, the topography we're dealing with. And on the second line here, you can see the number of structures. These are all structures. I've got a blow up in the next uh, tab. I'll show you more clearly. Um, on the eastern end here, we have, a, we have a Salan Valley, and we have 11 structures along here to construct, to get us hauling of, of this cut 10 and 11 down into this valley here. So it was a major constraint was to get the mountain bridge designed in time to get the, them constructed and then the, the airworks moving. And uh, the next slide I'll show you is this area here I've blown up which gives you a better profile of it. Um, this is the Bowhill River Bridge, the, the bridge that I'm going to talk about today. It's a very challenging location because it's in, it's in the, uh, the dip of the valley uh, in the Bowhill River. And the Bowhill River is, is a freshwater pearl mussel habitat. And there's also a carry slug habitat, which is a protected species in the scheme. Uh, this is cut one here, and cut one has got about 880,000 cube in it. We had to cross the valley. Uh, and, and be placed the whole way down as far as the as this land uh, bridge here. So that was probably the critical problem here was to get the Bowhill Bridge built. So we get the 880,000 uh, cube hauled. There's about 120,000 cube placed here and the balance was hauled down through here. And I suppose another few things to pick up here. Uh, you can see here there's ESB pylons, uh, 110 kVA crisscrossing the site. And that was another constraint that was we, we managed on the Bowhill Bridge. So we'll to talk about the Bowhill Bridge, uh, which was a combination of a lot of uh, different parties. Um, uh, obviously, John, John Craddock was the main contractor, Barry, the lead designer, it'd been Martin Bozak, uh, Pondio with a, with a temporary works design checker for the main structure, and he also did a temporary works design checker for the, for the, for the, for the, for the temporary works. Uh, GDG with, with, with a geotech uh, checker for the main works, and he also served as temporary works checker for the for the temporary works. AGL consultant did the temporary pier foundation uh, geotechnical design. Um, MRG did their temporary works design for pier form work and launch platforms. And SLO were ecological consultants on the job. And Takadi were the steel fabricator and obviously did the shop drawings and any, any temporary designs for uh, erection and assembly. And the Mooth were the were our launch partner. Um, and we engaged with the Caddy and my most of the time attender, and we involved them at the early stage, and they worked through the whole design process. It was all coordinated by Martin Heffern, consultant who acted as our design coordinator, and obviously the temporary works checker. I suppose the Bowhill River Bridge and um, the constraints, we, we sort of had to look at when we were time to attender. I was involved personally at that, at, at that particular point. And uh, that was the planning, it was a two span structure. But looking at the, at the topography and the land available, there wasn't really many more options. I'll show you that in the drawing in a minute. But uh, we, we did use, put in a temporary pier. So there was probably the thought that you could have a three-span structure, but at the time of planning, we went with the two-span structure. So that brought us to a, a, a steel beam for 80 meter. It's an 80 meter and a 40 meter two-span. So the 80 meter span, let's uh, say the steel beam. And there wasn't facility for any extravagance or for any other. You know, Enhancements for height. Uh, ecological habitats, uh, no more um, 
the rest of the project. It was it was a key uh, element to be to be considered in the construction of the bridge. Uh, the freshwater pearl mussel is present immediately downstream of the bridge, and the bridge is built over the Bohol Bridge, the Bohol River, and the carriage look habitat is all around the works area. Uh, you'll see on the next drawing the 110 kVA uh, HV power lines. There's, there's a, an overhead running particular, parallel to the bridge, very close, and there's an underground running underneath the bridge, uh, feeding the wind farm. Uh, the existing road access for ESB and landowners had to be maintained. Uh, the ground conditions again, this is, this is gravel over rock and uh, is a big flood risk. Uh, some of the drawings I'll show you in a minute and photographs, the Bohol uh, can look quite a small river at times, but the ground we're working on could flood over a meter uh, when there's a flash flood. And there was limited site access uh, to the site. Uh, so, really, coming from the west, uh, you would have to over cut one that wasn't accessible. And so, we had to build a three and a half kilometer haul route from the east. Uh, to come back up through the site to bring up the steel beams. Um, I'll just flick down to this. Um, this uh, this is the plan drawing here of the of the bridge site itself, and the blue here is the is the Bohol, the Bohol River. So you can see the way it meandered across uh, through the site. Now this is the ESB HV running parallel here, and this is the other ESB HV uh, running underneath. And then these are the carry slug habitats here and the freshwater pearl colony we're down along here. So you can see that we're building uh, in a bowl. Now there's an existing uh, road that will have to be maintained open uh, coming along here. So just flick back up. So uh, in the consideration of, of how we went about building the bridge, um, the overhead cables uh, were, were a big consideration. So we, 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 we came up with the concept of push launch to reduce the working at heights. Uh, and obviously working at heights would have a very a lot of downtime uh, due to obviously weather conditions uh, with wind. Uh, you would have also had uh, restricted working with ESB. Um, so that was really probably one of the drivers that we could assemble the bridge to the east away from the ESB cables and launch it out over it. And the other um, decision we made at the early stage was to go for cut in steel. And we did engage with our with Takadi about painted steel or, or Cortan steel, but really the environmental benefit of Cortan eliminated painting of the watercourse, which no matter how well we put it in, there's going to be some uh, snagging and touching up, and obviously then reduce the whole life cost and maintenance risk going forward. So that was a significant benefit probably to, to going with Cortan. Uh, the program benefits um, by the push launch method is meant that we can construct the bridge substantially uh, to the east, and then launch it. So Time from us launching the bridge and assembling it to the construction being completed was greatly shortened, and that's helped in the moving of cut one across the, the Bohol Bridge heading, heading, heading east with, with, with the fill. So really, we launched it a month ago. It was probably some of these notes was on was online and on, on, on media, and actually we poured the deck already. So that's less than a month from when we launched the bridge. So we've uh, about eighty percent of the deck poured at this stage. And the other benefits probably of going core ten was that, and it sort of merged in with the, with the launch methodology and the fact that we needed additional uh, one and a half mil face thickness for weathering steel that provided extra capacity in the temporary stage for the cantilever launch. Um, one of the other uh, probably considerations was how, uh, what foundations we went with at time of tender. Um, piles was in the specimen design but in the ground conditions some areas were the rocks were variable there's one side of the bit at the bottom and it could, it could be rocks sticking out of the ground the other side could be four meters deep uh, in on the pier, which is the biggest load in the, on the structure, uh, it actually um, is about maybe seven metres down to rock. And there was initially a consideration of concrete uh, board piles, but we were concerned about the, the, the gravels, the very porous gravels, and cement seepage into the watercourse would have, would have uh, put at risk for a power muscle. So we come up with a method of going uh, for our copper dam and, and, and the full bearing uh, uh, pad. So I'm just going down. That's the bridge form at tender stage there. As you see, it was a two span 80 meter and we had, we had a temporary um, pier here of facility of the launch. Brian can go through that in more detail um, later on. Uh, now I'll just hand over to Brian to run the video.
So I think the video uh, gave you a very good idea about the bridge and its construction. Uh, now, uh, let me provide you uh, with a little bit of information about the design. I would start with the, uh, with the overview of the history, basically how the design in its current form evolved through different project stages. And that can provide you a, a little bit of context uh, of the design itself. So when we started uh, working on the tender design, <coughs> baseline was the specimen design. Uh, the specimen design was in fact fairly prescriptive. Uh, it specified the span lengths, the form and shape of the pier, the profile of the girders. And there were two main reasons for that. Uh, first was the aesthetics of the bridge, how it should look like and how, how it should carry on that appearance through different uh, stages to the final uh, finished construction. The second reason was related to constraints. Uh, John already mentioned some of them, environmental constraints, proximity of utilities, uh, restrict, restricted access. So these were drivers of the conditions related to the, to the design. But otherwise, the, the bridge itself was fairly standard uh, structural form, three pairs of girders of curved profile. Uh, when we uh, worked on the uh, on the tender design, uh, the it, it became clear that constraints present at site uh, they they would drive the design itself. So that's why the, the push launch construction method was adopted, and that led to first change in the actual uh, structural form. Uh, we switched from variable girder depth, from curved girders to constant girder depth, because that was uh, suitable for push launch. But otherwise, uh, we still kept the three uh, pairs of girders uh, for, the, uh, for the tender. We also uh, added the temporary pier, uh, which is in fact spanning the river, creating some sort of a goal post to provide support for the push launch. And uh, in order to meet or to keep with the aesthetic requirements, uh, we introduced those curved fascia panels, which mimic uh, the curved girder uh, in, the, in the previous stage in the specimen design. Uh, moving on further in the detail design, uh, it brought further refi refinements in the design of the structure. Uh, the main the refinement or change uh, was a change of the form from multi girder from three pairs of girders into a ladder deck arrangement so pair of widely spaced uh, larger girders because that's the most efficient and suitable form for the selected construction through the push launch and we also made uh, some refinements in construction sequence in order to make the design of, of the girder as efficient as possible. Uh, here on this slide, <laughs> you can see uh, the basic bridge information and also its full name. It's Bohill River Bridge and Kappa Underbridge combined. So you can see that the full name of the structure is almost as long as its main span. But on the following slides, I will share with you uh, some key aspects uh, of the design itself. Uh, the main girder design. Uh, main challenge we, we were facing uh, in the detail design uh, was to keep the girder sizes or plate sizes within uh, the maximum uh, allowable dimensions. That meant that uh, we adopted maximum plate thickness 80, 80 mil. Uh, that was for meeting the requirements for fracture toughness. And it, it also meant to limit the, uh, the size or the width of the flange to about 1800 mil, uh, because that allows uh, the, the maximum outstand size to keep the flange as uh, designed as class two. And by Applying certain tweaks in the design, uh, we were uh, able to, to achieve that. Uh, 
in order to optimize the, the total weight of the steelwork, we split the, uh, the total length of the girder into six separate sections, as you can highlight it here, uh, which each section is having its own dimensions of plates, uh, thicknesses of plates, uh, as well as of width of, of flanges. And uh, as mentioned previously by John, uh, the contractor proposed to use weathering steel uh, that carries additional requirement to allow for corrosion. Uh, in our case, it, it was uh, 1.5 millimeters per exposed surface of the steelwork, which added about uh, 70 ton uh, of steelwork, about 10% of steelwork weight. But on the other hand, it reduces the long-term maintenance cost and, and whole life cost. Uh, since the girder is uh, fairly deep, uh, it is in part designed as a class four section, and <clears throat> that required uh, us to consider uh, the web buckling. Uh, so we performed the detailed modeling uh, in order to confirm that the, the web uh, will have minimum deformation. And we, we confirmed that, yeah, with uh, our adopted minimum 25 uh, millimeter thick de uh, web. Uh, we can achieve that. So that was main girder. <coughs> Cross beams, uh, they are spaced at uh, four meters uh, to facilitate deck formwork panels. Uh, as you can see on, on these, uh, these sketches, uh, there are fairly wide cantilevers on this bridge. Uh, there are two main reasons for that. First, it allows uh, to reduce the spacing of main girders and therefore reduce the size of the cross girders. Uh, there's also, and that's, that's main reason is the aesthetics because with the deep uh, gear girder, uh, the cantilever should increase its length uh, in order to keep the proper proportion between the two and the visual appearance from the side. Although, uh, of course, there are fascia panels uh, in the uh, around the pier, but uh, still we felt that the three meter uh, cantilever was appropriate and it's supported by steelwork. So it allows placement of, uh, uh, of permanent formwork over the whole width of the deck. Uh, <clears throat> coming to the deck slab, uh, during the design, uh, especially detail design, as well as tender design, uh, we consider different options for the deck slab from full, fully precast deck uh, panels with in-situ stitches to uh, non-participating uh, thin uh, permanent forework. In the end, <coughs> after discussions with uh, the contractor, uh, we adopted the uh, wide slab uh, permanent formwork, uh, which is participating. Uh, the permanent forework panels are uh, typically about 2.4 meter wide. Uh, they are 75 meter deep and they have lattices uh, which protrude into the in-situ uh, part of the deck slab. Uh, as it is the case with uh, most of ladder deck bridges, uh, the deck slab is actually considered slender uh, because of the uh, spacing of the main girders. So uh, the design of the deck slab itself had to consider second order effects and buckling effects uh, of the concrete slab. Well, uh, that was just briefly about the, uh, the superstructure. Now, the substructure design. Uh, we have uh, both abutments uh, of skeletal type. Uh, each girder is supported by a pair of columns uh, so that the size of columns can be kept to minimum and they would fit within the, uh, within the block of reinforced earth surrounding them. One drawback related to skeletal abutment is that it is not, uh, not as stiff as, uh, as uh, a full height abutment uh, standard one. Uh, it is usually not a problem, <clears throat> but in our case, uh, especially on the west abutment where columns are tall, they are supported on spread foundations, and uh, most importantly, uh, 
We have very deep diaphragm walls at, the, at both ends. It led to large uh, lateral earth pressures uh, on both abutments. And without any mitigation, that would lead uh, to probably large deformations and, and uh, problems uh, also with the, with the sizing for the substructure. So we adopted a solution of providing a wraparound reinforced fill behind uh, both abutments, uh, which contains that uh, earth pressure uh, or earth pressures, yes, uh, and uh, can reduce it uh, by about 90%. And that allowed us to make better economy with the substructure design itself, or as well as with the superstructure, uh, because it affects the, uh, for example, the bearings, uh, the fixed bearings, which are located at the permanent pier. Uh, <clears throat> In the last part of uh, this overview, I would like to mention a few thoughts about the construction stage design. Uh, as mentioned previously, uh, the key stage or one of key stages uh, of the construction of this bridge was a push launch. So we worked closely together with uh, the launch specialist Mahmoud and together we had to overcome uh, or face different many challenges uh, related to the push launch. One of them was the launch geometry. Uh, the road alignment is in SAC curve. So there's a variable uh, longitudinal gradient on the bridge. Uh, the steelwork is pre-cumbered up to almost 300 mil uh, in the main span. And <clears throat> the result of that is quite irregular girder profile. And for the launch, we didn't want to introduce additional stresses in the steel work. So we were searching for the best fit curve, so to say, uh, over which the structure can be launched. And uh, we found that yeah, about six kilometers uh, radius of the curve uh, would uh, suit that. Uh, so the launch platform uh, was constructed to the, that radius and, and that allowed the, uh, the smooth launch of the structure. Also, uh, the important aspect of the launch was the stability uh, because the, during the first launch phase, uh, we had a 48 meter long cantilever uh, over uh, total length of the steel work, 90 meters. So, we had to provide some additional counterweight uh, to keep the, uh, the steelwork stable. And Brian will, will cover uh, that in more detail. And also to keep the horizontal stability of the steelwork during the launch, we provide a temporary horizontal X bracing at the front 40 meters uh, of the structure. Uh, another key construction stage uh, is the removal of temporary supports. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we were aiming for uh, most efficient girder design in terms of sizes and, and weight. And since the removal of temporary pier affects the stresses in the main girder, uh, you can see on those uh, two stress diagrams on the top, that there's in fact a reversal of stress uh, in, the, uh, in the girder as you remove the, uh, the temporary pier. So <clears throat> we specify that the temporary pier will be removed uh, after the deck is finished and when the full composite section is effective. That reduces the stresses, uh, stress in the main girder. Uh, another, uh, another feature, another step which helped us in the girder design uh, and to reduce the stress uh, in the girder at the critical section <coughs> at the main pier uh, was that we specified that the structure will be lowered or jacked down on permanent bearings at pier again after the deck construction is finished. And again, that will lead to sort of a stress reversal or, or stress reduction in that highly stressed area, about 10% reduction. Uh, and altogether, 
uh, this allowed us to make the main girder uh, work. So uh, these were this covers main aspects of the design. And now I hand over to Brian Cronan, construction manager, uh, who will talk more about the actual construction. Thank you, Martin. Uh, so, uh, just um, so just briefly talk through the different stages of the of the construction. So uh, we started off with the foundations, so at the east and the west abutment, then followed on with the, the pier foundations. Uh, then work commenced on the substructure on the skeletal abutment columns and the reinforced earth panels. And then to the to the east side, then we received delivery of the steel and started the on-site assembly works of the steel uh, for the structure. Following on then the, the launch itself. So the launch itself was done in two stages. So the structure, 90 meters of structure was assembled first and then launched as far as the permanent pier with the remaining 31 meters of the structure added on at the end and then completed the second launch, launching the structure to the, to the west abutment. Uh, following on that, the deck works uh, for the so for the superstructure, the final placement of the of the permanent precast panels, and then the in situ section of the pour for the deck on top. So the foundation, so the abutment foundation construction itself, so that the works there commenced last August and uh, August twenty twenty. Uh, firstly, starting off on the on the east abutment, then followed on to the west abutment. So each, each of those bases, they were excavated down to, to the rockhead level and then upfilled with a minimum upfill layer of 6N uh, just prior to the blinding and then commenced work on the, on the in situ uh, reinforcement and concrete works. So in, in total, each of the east and west abutment bases are just under 120 cubic concrete. Uh, they were about four meters wide, uh, 20, 20 meters long and uh, 1.5 meters deep. Uh, the pier then, so as John mentioned earlier, so the, the pier itself is right on the, the edge of the riverbank with the, with the final pier um, actually overhangs out over the, the, red of, over the edge of the river. Uh, so for this reason, we uh, decided to install a sealed cofferdam at this location. Uh, so the, the cofferdam um, was um, commenced in September last year as well. Uh, so the, the cofferdam size was 12 and a half meters by nine and a half meters by four meters deep. Again, so the, 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 high, the high rockhead level there, so the, the, the cofferdam was excavated down to dense gravels, which would then um, the blinding was poured and the, the pier base founded on that as well. Uh, the base itself was at nine meters by seven meters by 1.5. And there was just over 95 cubic concrete uh, in, the, in the pier as well. Uh, the substructure then, so as Martin uh, uh, touched on earlier, so the substructure consisted of the skeletal abutments and there was one meter diameter columns at the east abutment and 900 mil diameter columns at the west. Uh, so the, the permanent pier then, so the permanent pier was um, particularly challenging um, due to the shape of it. Uh, so it actually um, it was eight meters wide at the base and then continued on in a seven and a half meter uh, radius to 18.9 meters at the top at its widest point. So the temporary works involved in this um, involved careful planning and execution. And I'll briefly touch on that on the next slide. And then following the, the column installation, so works uh, then commenced on the reinforced earth panels on the structure at the east and west, west abutment. There was over 1500 uh, square meters of reinforced earth panel on this structure alone. So the pier then, uh, so some of the temporary works involved in the, the farm work for the pier. So due to the, due to the close proximity to the river, uh, we had to use a cantilevered construction to, to form the radiuses. So we had uh, two uh, 600 um, twin I-beams that sat on the base of the pier and cantilevered out on both sides, just past the edge of the river bank at, at Bohill River. Uh, from there then we installed a rapid shore scaffolding system uh, to prop up the radial formwork uh, on site. Uh, so the, all the timber work on site was fabricated um, on site. Uh, then the radial shutters, they were, they were constructed in short sections and with uh, strong backs and timbers cut to the profile of the radius. Uh, there was over 30 ton of reinforcement that had to be tied in situ uh, for, for the pier. Uh, the concrete pour itself then, so there was, just, there was 232 cube of concrete poured 
And then due also due to the complex nature of the temporary works, the rate of rise was had to be carefully monitored uh, during the pour, and it was limited to one meter uh, per hour. So in total, the pour took just over 10 hours to complete. And also due to the depth um, of the base of the, of the pier, so the pier was two meters deep, uh, there were some concerns around thermal cracking. So it was decided that a GGBS mix would be utilized just to reduce the, the internal temperature of the concrete by a couple of degrees during curing. So the steelwork fabrication and assembly. Uh, so there was over 700 ton of weathering steel required for the bridge construction. So between the main beams, the cross beams and the cantilevered beams. So the steel uh, itself was supplied, uh, manufactured, and then assembled on site by our specialist subcontractor to Caddy. So the steel was fabricated into Caddy's facility in Seville, which is in the south of Spain, and then transported to, um, from Seville to the Port of Cork at Ring Esquiddy at the end of January 2021. Uh, you can see there in the photos um, on the top left, that's the trial assembly of the structure into Caddy's facility in Seville, and then the subsequent delivery at Ring Esquiddy uh, being unloaded. Uh, the eight main girders then, so the bridge is broken down into four modules. Uh, so we had eight main girders. They were uh, over 30 meters in length and just under four meters wide. So the beams had to be transported on their side and they were transported to site from Ring uh, on at night uh, under, under escort. Uh, the works then, they commenced then on site with the assembly. So I'll show you a very brief video just to give you a scale of the beams. So these are the beams coming through coming through McCroom uh, town. So those of you that will be familiar with uh, McCroom town, there's a couple of bends there by McCroom castle. And then just as you come over uh, the bridge uh, over, over the river Salan in, in McCroom town. So it does give you a side uh, scale of, it gives you a view of the, of the size of the beams. As you can see, they're, they're quite wide when they're, when they're turned on their side. And you had to negotiate some tight turns coming through McCroom and then further west out towards the, the bends on the way to, to Ballyvorney as well, by final delivery onto site at, at Toon Lane. So the bridge uh, launch itself, <clears throat> so the, the steel beams were delivered uh, to site, offloaded on site with craneage on site, and then the beams were verticalized um, onto temporary supports, uh, which you can see in the center of, of the, fo the photo on the center. Uh, the beams were then fully assembled, the bridge was fully assembled on site then with the cross beams installed, the cantilevered, and the additional knee braces installed on site. Uh, the splice joints then between the different modules were welded together on site. Uh, as you can see there from some of the photos then, so the launch itself, so there was a, the radius uh, that Martin was talking about earlier, so the six kilometer radius that was mimicked on a launch platform uh, just to the east of the structure. So we had to uh, install two concrete strip footings and where you can see there in the photos, you have the, the, concrete, um, the concrete footing and then you have a, a steel skid track, which is used to keep the bridge on alignment during the launch. Underneath at different locations in the structure, then we uh, installed some skid shoes. So each skid shoe had a capacity of 150 ton uh, to, to jack the structure, which was then uh, at the very rear of the structure. So in the photo at the bottom right, you can see the horizontal beam at the very rear of the structure, which is the pulling beam that was then used to pull the structure along um, into, into its uh, position. <clears throat> so at the, at the east abutment, so there was a, an active pulling beam installed. Uh, it was installed and fixed to the the foundation base and then also fixed to the to the cross beam at the top of the columns so fixed to that pulling beam you had two strand jacks each with a 70 ton capacity at uh, each which then fed the strands back to the rear pulling beam it's attached to the rear pulling beam and then the strands then pulled the structure out into position so each of each of the strand jacks like i was saying had the 70 ton capacity uh, due to the low friction during the pull with the teflon pads and and the soaping of the teflon pads during the launch there was never uh, over 40 ton uh, per jack required to pull the structure into its position. Uh, at the abutment then, so you had the, the, the bearing plinths at each abutment. So on top of those, you had a, a sliding bearing again with Teflon pads on top that were used 
uh, to, to reduce the friction during the launch with a, a lateral guidance system attached to the side of those to keep the horizontal alignment during the launch. Uh, I'll show those briefly in a video in a second, just so people can understand those. And at the rear, those sliding bearings, then there was two 500, 500 ton jacks that allowed the structure, the rear of the structure to be lifted once the launch was complete and allowed the removal of the temporary sliding bearing and the installation of the permanent bearing then in its position. Uh, so the temporary pier then, so due to the large span, so as Martin was saying, there was a 48-meter 48 cant 48 cantilever from the east abutment uh, to, to the temporary pier. So it was required to install a temporary pier that spanned the river. So there was two modular beams that were lifted into position over, over the river uh, with uh, columns and bracing on top. Uh, so the pier itself, the temporary pier, had a capacity of 1,000 ton. So at each column location, there was a 500-ton jack that allowed the structure to be raised and lowered. And following on the final um, deck pour, it'll allow the structure then to be lowered into its final uh, position. Uh, on the bottom right of that drawing, you can see there, so at the front nose of the structure, there was a requirement to install a deflection recovery jack. So as the structure was being launched out, it was expected that there would be deflections at the nose of the structure, anything up to 260 millimeters. So this jack was installed at both girders at the front nose of the structure to recover the deflection during the launch. So this is a short video just showing. So you can see the, the sliding bearings here and the lateral guidance system at the permanent pier. Again, these are the jacks that will be used to lift the structure following the deck pour. This is the temporary pier. Uh, so you have the two pair, you have the pair of beams that span across the Bowhill River and the columns, and then you have the jack underneath here, and you have a further sliding bearing on both sides. At the nose of the structure, then you have the deflection recovery jacks that are fixed to the front nose that, will use, that were used to recover the deflection. And as Martin was talking earlier um, through his part of the presentation, on top here, you can see the cross bracing that was used for stability during the launch. There's a set of the braces here and a further setback further. Uh, so this is an overview of the structure in position. So you can see the, the permanent precast uh, formwork slabs. And furthermore here, we had a section of the deck that was poured uh, prior to the first launch to, to act to give the additional counterweight it needed to the rear of the structure during the launch. Uh, careful consideration and planning went into this section of the deck. So this section of the deck that was poured, this 10 meter section actually spans over the existing local road uh, thus negating the need to carry out any further works over the local road uh, for following on from that. Uh, so the permanent performer panels are placed there and then fi final um, positioning of those former panels after the launch on, on the western end of, of the structure. Uh, the deck construction then, so that you can see here the, the cantilevered section of the deck with, um, with the um, permanent formwork panels uh, there then on, on the deck itself. So the deck itself had to be poured in, in two uh, sections. So we've continued on, on site currently, we have poured, uh, as John was saying earlier, 80% of the deck at the minute with this section being poured, that section of the deck being poured, this section. Uh, following on from that then, uh, we'll pour the section of the deck over the permanent pier and over the temporary pier. Uh, so I suppose just on the permanent formwork panels, there was just under 200 uh, permanent formwork panels uh, required for, for the deck. Uh, the deck itself is 250 mil thick, with 75 mil being the precast panel and 175 of the in situ uh, section of the deck. Total area of the deck was just over 2,200 square meters and required 435 cube of concrete to be poured on the deck. Uh, to total and the total um, in situ concrete requirements on the site are just over 1500 cubic meters uh, with just over 300 ton of reinforcement also required for the for the structure. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Brian. Um, also to, to, to Martin and John, uh, excellent presentation. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be working on that project as well. Um, you know, and it, it's an absolutely great achievement as part of a, 
obviously a, a much larger project. Um, so look, folks, um, I see there's a couple of questions come, have come in already. Uh, down at the bottom of your screens, there's the Q&A button, uh, so you can ask questions using that. Um, I am conscious that this is a, a lunchtime lecture, so we'll probably just take a few a few questions and kind of wrap up then maybe coming up to two o'clock. Um, you know, so that people can get, get, get back to their day jobs. Um, so I might hand over there to Jonathan who's going to uh, go through the, the, the questions for us. Thanks, Ronan. We have, we have a lot of questions, so we might not get to all of them. But um, I suppose the first question is, what is the design life of the structure? And has this been factored in with the weathering steel? So, Martin, you might uh, take that one. Yeah, sure. Uh, the bridge design is done to Eurocodes, so that requires a minimum 120 year design life and that allowance for corrosion 1.5 mil per surface that uh, should allow uh, required lifespan, yeah, over 100 years. Okay, and we, we have one, uh, I suppose it's a general question just with respect to all structures on the job. I noticed that there's new bridges in McCroom have black paint on them. Uh, what is the reason for this? Yeah, that's probably the waterproofing uh, to the substructure elements that people are seeing as they're going past in uh, the back of abutments and bases. Yeah. There's no uh, colouring on beams or any exposed concrete. Okay, and then uh, this one's probably from Merton again. Was efficient use made of the rear ballast steel, Merton? Um, yeah, well, um, theoretically, the, the steelwork would be stable even without the section of the deck port, uh, but to provide additional margin of, uh, of safety, and also, as Brian mentioned, uh, it brought additional advantage of pouring that in advance that the, that, that section is over the existing road. So there are less issues with working over, uh, over the road. And uh, just have another question there. When do you anticipate you're, you're going to be able to haul over the structure and uh, take the material from cut one? Um, I suppose, Brian, do you want to pick that one there? Yeah, uh, so the so the, the key uh, milestone the project, as John was explaining earlier, is to get across cut one. So from mid-June, uh, the reinforced earth will be complete and the, the deck will be able to be hauled over by construction traffic. Okay, and then a, a specific question to, I suppose, to Martin in particular, uh, was steel used high tensile steel uh, or was it mild? And uh, what is the deflection allowed on the, on the steel structure? Uh, well, the reinforcement is high tens tensile steel, uh, 500 megapascals uh, standard reinforcement. Uh, the main steel work is uh, S355 steel, so 350 uh, megapascals uh, strength. That's fairly standard and I'd say 90% of, of bridge structures in the UK and Ireland would be uh, S355. Okay, we have a, another question. Um, how is the interface with the Kerry slug managed? We, we might have that one to John Killen. Well, it's managed uh, with, with our environmental manager, uh, Niall Gibbons, on the project, uh, and our consultant, SLR, engaged with the Kerry slug group. Uh, there's uh, Evan Morkins has been, it's part of a long-term uh, uh, translocation plan on, along the scheme. Uh, probably one of the constraints in the project is that the site was narrow, but then there was another area taken uh, along three quarters of the site along the strip of the boundary as a translocation for Kerry Slug. So there's an ongoing uh, long-term project to, 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 to translocate Kerry Slug that we're probably coming in in, in a small part of it for our three-year period. So it was in his commenced part of starting work and to be ongoing after we finish works. And we have another question there with respect to, 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 to regulating course and in the deck surfacing. And is there a specific sequence uh, to manage deflections uh, in, the, in the concrete pour? Um, well, <clears throat> the, uh, the design takes into account 
the, the sequence of works. So uh, there's anticipated uh, deflection. And uh, yeah, when the deck is poured, we will have to evaluate the, the actual alignment or actual deflection and compare it to the design. Uh, but uh, there will be some deflection uh, long term because the concrete is material which uh, creeps in, in long term. So uh, yeah, there are some minor long term changes, but we don't uh, expect uh, huge deviations from from the anticipated values uh, during the construction. Uh, I think this one might be for you, Brian. Um... How did you plan the logistics of getting the beam to site via the, the local road network? Uh, so due, early on, due, we knew due to the size of the beams that the, the majority of the beams, the main beams, would be abnormal loads. So with close consultation with the local area engineer in McCroom and, and the local Garda station, uh, we, we, did, we discussed and agreed the best time and the duration for the delivery of those beams to, to site, trying to reduce the disruption to the local community as much as possible for those deliveries. Okay. And on that, just on behalf of Car County Council, we'd like to thank the local community, but particularly the, the residents in uh, Bali Vakira and Bali Vorna, who, who were very uh, good during the actual construction period themselves. And I, I know some of them are, are attending the, the lecture here today. Um, I think I might hand back over to Ronan Keane because we're just about coming up upon the hour. Um, and I'd, I'd ask you just to have... Can I just say something there? I'll frank that as well. Like, I mean, we, we couldn't have delivered the project as, as, as seamlessly to date on the Bowhill without the collaboration of the landowners in, in the vicinity. And particularly, obviously, PJ is, is, our, is our next door neighbour and uh, the assistance and, and welcome we got in Balivori. And I think, I think they, they acknowledge that this is a benefit to the, to the time in the long term. But definitely, we've had a lot of good cooperation in delivering that. And, and, and again, from all the other stakeholders in the project, be it the IFI, you know, UPS, and ESB indeed were, were very, uh, you know, the advanced works of them moving the pylons ahead of our work. So I think there's, there's been a lot of cooperation to achieve what we've done to date. And I suppose I can't finish without saying that Kevin McSweeney and Pat Fenley is the engineer and the foreman on the bridge, and they've done exceptional work uh, to get us to the stage that we've kept the program. Um, so the folks, um, Apologies now to, to anybody whose questions we didn't get to, but look, again, the, the fact that it's a lot of time lecture, we're a bit more constrained on time. Um, you know, there's obviously huge interest in, 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 in the, the, the topic. We had nearly 400 attendees at it, which is, you know, a, a huge number and a large number of questions as well, which kind of is an indication of the, the engagement um, from, from the audience. Unfortunately, while you know, the virtual platform allows us to, to you know, go to lunchtime and to, to reach a large audience. It doesn't allow the traditional uh, round of applause in appreciation for our speakers. Uh, but look, speaking, I, I suppose, both as somebody who worked on the project, but also objectively, um, you know, as, as, as a member of the, the, the Cork Region Committee and having, you know, sat in on quite a number of presentations over the year and that, and that uh, you know, it's an absolutely excellent presentation use of drone footage, use of the animations to, to um, illustrate various points uh, is very, very good. So once again, um, I'd like to, to thank uh, Martin, John and Brian, our main speakers, and also uh, Jonathan Noonan uh, for, for, for emceeing the event. Um, so look, folks, without further ado, I will draw the event to a close and uh, wish you all a, a, a pleasant day. Thank you very much. Thank you.